So good morning. Uh, I'm Todd Moore. Uh, I'm IBM's VP for Open Technology. I've uh, been involved in open source for a pretty long time, uh, back to the days of when we first found Linux and decided to start bringing it into IBM and through many, many projects. Uh, I was part of OpenStack before we had an OpenStack foundation. Uh, I worked with Mark and, and Jonathan to help structure what we were doing, write the bylaws, put things together, stand it up. And, and I've been part of the board the entire time. Uh, what we've done today here in the IBM track is to really just come and, and put together uh, hopefully some exceptionally good information on, for those of you who are getting started here in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we're going to go dive in deep on microservices. And we've got friends here with us to, to help us go and do that too. Folks from AT&T and, uh, thank you, ah, good, appreciate that. Folks from uh, AT&T and Materna, so we'll have real use cases that we can go and talk about here in, in the morning. And uh, also along the way here, Jesse Proudman is, is going to come up. Uh, I think everybody knows Jesse from Blue Box or, and, uh, and his OpenStack fame of some of the great presentations he's given here over the years. So Jesse will be coming in to talk about uh, how we see the market and, and the possibilities around OpenStack and the things that, that we see our customers doing. And then in the afternoon, we're going to take a break around 4.30 and uh, serve some adult beverages and invite in the folks that if you went to the uh, keynote you, you saw the interop challenge everybody go to the keynote who didn't go to the keynote everybody go good um, so at the keynote uh, you know we we saw 16 companies up on stage there's actually 18 who did the interop challenge and all passed the test but we had room for 16 and, and they came and, and became part of it so uh, those folks are going to come back in, and uh, you can ask questions. You can talk about the best practices that they figured out along the way about how to go and do that, the tools they used. Uh, I think Brad talked about using Ansible and uh, the Shade plugin and uh, you know, the scripts that they used and how they, they structured it. So it was very easy to portably move an application from one cloud to the next. And, uh, and you heard Don Rippert reinforce the idea that, you know, interoperability, portability, choice is, is really important. And those are things that, uh, that we and IBM truly believe in. Uh, it's uh, all boats uh, float with a rising tide, right? We're creating a large market opportunity for everyone to come and play in. And, uh, and we've come together to go build OpenStack in a, a creative, collaborative, open way. So. Hopefully, uh, everybody who comes uh, sees that and uh, gets a chance to, to talk to those guys a little bit about how we've gone and accomplished that through RefStack and DevCore. Um, and then in the afternoon, we're going to have some of our folks who are really deep into what we've been doing in microservices and, and start sort of down through the basics at the infrastructure level and then walking it up through how you can go about deploying and building uh, microservices. And then a, a look at the end uh, through the eyes of DevOps, right? Because if you're going out there and you're building uh, your new cloud infrastructure and getting going and you're using all the same old processes that you used before, the same sign-off and check-offs and, and, and same delayed deployment processes that you have, that's probably not going to get you the kind of benefit that you are looking for. So we'll talk to you about how to go about thinking about everything that you do and thinking about how to integrate into that DevOps pipeline. So hopefully you'll come and in and out through the day and be part of it and, uh, or stay the entire day. Love to have you and uh, join the guys who, who did the interop challenge and, and have a drink with them as well along the way here. So thank you very much. And uh, let me turn it over to Shamil and Tyler and let you guys get going. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a little uh, OpenStack 101. Uh, how many people, is this your first summit you've ever been to? All right. A lot, a, a lot of new folks. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the madness. So uh, this is straight off the, the OpenStack.org uh, website. What is OpenStack? It's a cloud operating system, right? We can use to control pools of compute, storage, networking. Um, all through the data center, manage it through a single dashboard, single API. Um, but but like, let's kind of pull that apart a little bit. It's a group of open source projects. Um, right now, we're north of 60 official projects under uh, OpenStack uh, Big Ten governance. And all of these projects or services communicate with RESTful APIs. Um, it originally emerged from a collaboration between NASA and Rackspace in 2010. 
Um, the foundation is a totally separate, independent legal nonprofit entity that manages, you know, puts on these great summits uh, and, and handles all of the uh, governance of, of OpenStack. And it's written predominantly in Python. So that sounds great, but sometimes an analogy helps. So say your fridge looks like this and you're hungry. Um, one of the great options out there to get food, at least in the States, is a thing called Grubhub, um, where you can go online and they have food from all of these different local companies where you can get, if you want burgers, nachos, uh, you don't have to go directly to that company, you can go to Grubhub and, and pick out, you can even pick out a whole bunch of stuff. OpenStack really is the Grubhub of, uh, of, of computing here, where OpenStack's not providing the hypervisor, OpenStack's getting you resources from the hypervisor. So instead of those individual resources being considered all part of OpenStack, it's a totally pluggable architecture. So just like Grubhub may add a new uh, barbecue restaurant, uh, OpenStack may add support for a new storage array, a new networking technology, or a new hypervisor, uh, just by adding new drivers. So OpenStack's that in-between layer between you know, you as the user and the underlying resources, uh, where a lot of people think they're, it's, it's all just one, one component. And, and on that note, here, here's really, I think, what's important, what it isn't. Uh, so a hyper, it's not a hypervisor, and supports a pretty large number of hypervisors, uh, including vSphere. Um, it's not a free VMware replacement. This is something we, we see people take a look at OpenStack for and struggle with mightily. We're like, oh, well, we pay money for licenses, so let's just do this free OpenStack stuff, and it's, it's, it's not like that. It's much more similar to the AWS model or, or, uh, or Google model where it's the idea that instances are much more ephemeral. So the, you're not, you know, it's the, the whole pets versus cattle um, analogy. This is, this is where, you're, where your uh, cattle live versus your pets. Uh, and the key thing is it, OpenStack itself is not a product. You can get it through vendors like IBM and, and others in the ecosystem, but the, the code itself is, is fully open source uh, and available directly without having to go to a vendor if you don't want to. And because of that, it's not a single distribution. So there's no one OpenStack. Each vendor takes it and curates their own distributions, just like Linux. Uh, so when you're, you, if you're comfortable with the Linux model, uh, OpenStack follows that uh, pretty similarly. And it's also not a single pr project. Like we talked about, there's north of 60 projects in the Big Tent now. Um, you say, well, we're using OpenStack. It's usually, well, then what, pro what projects within the OpenStack community are you using? Are you using, uh, you know, are you using Nova or Neutron or Keystone or Magnum or Barbican or? And on that note, <laughs> by the way, uh, on that note, I would also like to add there's actually a project navigator on OpenStack.org which, because there are 60 different projects, that it is really helpful, especially when you're starting into OpenStack, uh, to go there. In the Project Navigator, you can see a brief description of each service within, the pro within OpenStack, as well as who the PTL is, along with some maturity indicators as well, as far as like what's the adoption rate for the service, uh, how many SDKs support it. Is, you know, so you can get a good sense of what is the service and how many people are using it in a very simple snapshot using Project Navigator. Yeah. And, that, and that's really key because I think uh, you know, a lot of us are used to the model of this is a GA software, this is beta, and, and open source in general, but specifically OpenStack doesn't follow that model. So it's, it's, is the project ready? Well, it depends. Does it meet your maturity guidelines? Uh, so for you, a, uh, online upgrades, are you, that's a bare minimum for your particular deployment. Well, that you may judge that for which projects fit that, which ones don't. Um, it's not a storage platform. Um, obviously, there's storage projects within there, uh, including Swift. And it's not network virtualization. It supports a wide range of network virtualization technologies. We saw a lot of the cool stuff even yesterday with the NFV um, use cases around OpenStack. But OpenStack of itself, again, like Grubhub, it's, it's, it doesn't have any of the food itself. It's, it's getting it from somewhere else. So it supports a, a wide range of, of technologies. One, one of the questions. You know, we talked about here, here's what OpenStack is, but wh why does it matter? Why is it important? Why are we all here? Why did, why did we come to Barcelona? It's one of the only open source projects that gives the full comprehensive cloud services a framework to build a, a comprehensive cloud. Um, significant, as we, we saw in the keynote, significant cloud service providers are using OpenStack. Uh, and like Linux, we think it's going to have a larger impact on organizations in the future. So as, as Linux has quickly become the the de facto server platform, we're, we're seeing OpenStack be that de facto cloud platform. 
And, and really, it's, it's over at this point. So there was, you know, in not a few, a few years ago, there was a number of different options here. Um, but we've really seen OpenStack as kind of taken that mantle of the open source cloud option. So I mentioned before, it started in 2010. NASA and Rackspace uh, got together and decided to, to start this project. Uh, and it got going. And in 2011, the first public cloud was uh, launched using the Nova and Swift projects. And from there, that was when it, it hit a key growing point, which a growing pain point, which is you know, people were uncomfortable with a single company controlling it. And that's when the foundation was created. So the foundation was created, and, and OpenStack was moved there. Uh, and that's really when it started to take off. So Following those twice a year release cycles, Grizzly added block storage and networking. Uh, the OpenStack uh, Marketplace, that's another great resource on the OpenStack.org webpage. So you know, if you saw the interoperability demo this morning, you can also go in there, look up providers, and see if their distribution or managed cloud offering passed all of the RefStack tests. Uh, you can see all that there. It's right in the marketplace. So you can see where your options are, where you want to go to get OpenStack. Uh, 2015, last year, was when the uh, big tent model that we, that we talked about earlier was introduced to bring all these other projects into, into OpenStack. And another big one last year was CERN crossing 150,000 cores. And then we heard yesterday that they're north of 190,000 cores. So very large use cases, very large scale for OpenStack. And then this year, you know, we, we just, just um, not too long ago, Newton came out. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Newton release. I would say that you know the growth is still staggering. Like if you look at every summit, just as we saw in this room, when we first asked how many people are attending the summit for the first time. On average, 50% plus people are new to the summit every every time. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely more and more people also, um, you know, joining the community, becoming members, and participating. And so the the pace is phenomenal. Yeah, and this and this just uh, continues that you can see the number of companies, individual members of the foundation. Um, as well as, you know, north of north of 6,000 developers contributing, and uh, as of now, th over 300,000 code contributions. So it, it's a it's a project of staggering size, uh, and it's just the only way that's possible is just all the people in the community contributing in in many different ways. So I mentioned the twice a year um, release cycle. Basically, the the way this is organized is. Um, the names of them are in alphabetical order, and they're based on where the design summit location was. So that's why we're on Newton. The next one's Okada. And as we go through each one, the, 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 and every, anyone that's a member of the foundation can, can get a vote uh, on the, uh, and, and nominate potential names for releases to a year. But projects can release independently. So Swift's a common one that, that releases off cycle. Uh, but projects can release when, whenever they want. But um, it's, it's captured together in those, in those twice a year releases. The stable branch is um, the support schedule for you know, what happens. OK, Newton, Newton's out now. What happens to I'm running Metaka? You know, what happens to me now? I'm running a, you know, n-1 release. So it's showing all the what happens past there. So that first six months, all the bug fixes are backported. Uh, when you get to that six, 12 months, it, that's when it's critical bugs and security patches. And then once it's over a year old, it's basically just security fixes. Yeah. And, and a key distinction here is this is the upstream support model as well. So you know, there's different models for support as well, but this is what the community has to adhere to. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's a key, key point. Um, obviously, the individual vendors then can, can extend that however they want. And that's, that's some of the value some of the, you know, we can provide as vendors to, to the community is supporting specific releases for longer, uh, packaging, uh, pulling, pulling patches back, things like that. And, and on that note, um, the, other, the other question again is these different ways. We talked about there's distro vendors and all, and all these different ways to get OpenStack. And, and this is an analogy that, that we like a lot is coffee, right? So, if you like coffee like us, you can get it a number of ways. And the easiest way is to go across the mall and walk up to the Starbucks, place an order, and you'll get your, uh, your latte handed to you right there. And that is you know, what we do at, at IBM with our uh, Bluemix private cloud is it, it's fully managed OpenStack. So we do all that work for you. 
Um, if you're looking for a little bit more control, that's where you get into with your coffee. You can go to get your Keurig machine, and then you're still limited. There, there's different pods you can get, but you can't get anything you want. Um, but it's it's packaged for you, so it gets a lot easier. You can control the strength, and you have some more control over it. Uh, so that's more like the distribution vendor. So they have their own packaging and, and how they manage things, but it gives you uh, uh, more control over your environment. And obviously, the, there's always the do-it-yourself option. So you can roast your own beans, grind them. French press and get exactly the, the, the exact coffee you want. That's really the do-it-yourself open stack model. So a, as you're going in that direction, you're getting more flexibility in exchange for you're doing more of the heavy lifting. So it, it's really finding as a open stack user, it's finding the model that works for you and your company to be the most successful. The way all the services work. Um, this is a pretty, pretty straightforward framework. Each, each service is a little bit different, each project, but this is kind of a high level. They're pretty, they're pretty similar from this perspective. So you, you start always with an API on the top, and inner service communications always via that API. There's a message queue that connects that API to a scheduler of sorts. So say we're talking about Nova, and you want to make an API request to spin up some instances. Uh, the scheduler is taking that request and figuring out which resources are available to be able to service that. The underlying service, there's always some, there's a database on the back end uh, to provide the, the, you know, keeping track of all the resources that that individual project has, you know, which VMs you've created, all those things, if it's Neutron, which networks you have. Uh, and then that talks down to a driver, a plugin to talk to that individual uh, piece. So if you're using Nova and you're using KVM, you know, the Libvirt plugin, uh, if you're using VMware, Zen, Hyper-V, each of them have their own plug-in, and then that's how it talks to the underlying provider. So like we talked about earlier, the hypervisor, uh, OpenStack isn't a hypervisor, it works for all these different hypervisors. In that case, that's when it talks to the, the specific hypervisors. So because of that, it gives you the ability to use different things on the data plane, and in some of the project cases, multiple at the same time. So you could support multiple different um, underlying components. And because of that, the key piece is the, the interoperability. And, and now we've been talking, you know, we saw it in the, in the keynote. We're talking about it now and th throughout. And I don't know, you want to talk a little bit more about uh, interop? Okay. Yeah, so um, interoperability in OpenStack, you know, a simple way to uh, explain it is to use an example of standard uh, power uh, plugs, basically. So if you think about it, really, your programming interface uh, is the same as having a uh, power interface as well. So the OpenStack API can be considered the plug, which is a defined, falls a defined standard. And because of that, uh, regardless of what appliance you have, or in this case, application that you've built, as long as you're, you're uh, interfacing with the plug in a standardized manner, you can you know, plug in, basically. And at the same time, because that plug is standardized, it doesn't matter whether you're plugging you know, a laptop or a toaster into your home or office, which in this case could be different OpenStack clouds. Uh, so effectively, by standardizing on the interface, we are able to accommodate different types of appliances. And you know, vendors or providers can actually do different things. You can have you know, different cord links. You can have different types of cords, et cetera, as long as the plug is the same. And at the same time, you can take your laptop from home to your office and vice versa uh, because you're, you're plugging into the same standardized plug. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the goal of uh, you know, having that open API, open standard, is avoiding that lock-in. So yeah, you, have, you, have, you don't have a laptop that only plugs in at your house that you can't plug in at the office. And that's really what OpenStack brings you, is that capability to build your apps and then run them on any compatible OpenStack cloud. And the number of projects we talked about, north of 60 already, this is just a, a small subset of the, of the projects that are out there and their, their uh, names. Some are pretty clever. Um, but they, there's all the type of things you would think of in a cloud. You know, if you want DNS as a service, key management, you know, a service catalog, uh, all these different, in the database as a service, there's all these projects in OpenStack that can satisfy the needs uh, of your particular cloud and what you need. And you just decide which of those projects you want to deploy. If you want, um, you know, if you want to do bare metal, there's the ironic project. Um, you know, you pick those things. Generally, people deploy the core, you know, the, the Keystone, Nova, Neutron uh, kind of core. But it's up to you as an individual user which which projects make sense to you. Some of the popular use cases for OpenStack: uh, web hosting, 
high throughput computing, you know, like we heard yesterday from CERN, uh, running public clouds like we heard today from a lot of the, the, you know, the number of European public clouds running on OpenStack, web services and e-commerce type workloads, um, big data, databases as a service, uh, video processing and content delivery. Uh, and, and a big one now we're seeing is containers. So containers are great, things like Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, um, but, but what do we run, the, run those on? So we see a lot, of, a lot of people using OpenStack to deploy the resources to run those containers. Yep. And, and beyond just the use cases, um, there's also you know, a multitude of markets and organization types that are using OpenStack as well. So you've got everything from, you know, as we've seen through the keynotes and probably through, through the summit so far, you've got research organizations using OpenStack, you've got telecom using OpenStack, enterprise, et cetera. And so depending on your market and, and your needs, there's actually uh, working groups within OpenStack as well, which align to that. So if you are, you know, in the academic or research industry, you can actually work, uh, participate in a scientific working group and uh, you know, get together with your peers to kind of discuss what are your common needs and uh, same for enterprise. But it's just not use cases. There's also uh, you know, the markets uh, in OpenStack are very diverse and broad as well. Yeah, absolutely. And to, to kind of help navigate that and, and figure out, well, well you know, we talked about different ways you can consume it, manage versus distributions versus do it yourself, uh, different projects you can deploy. How do, how do we figure out the OpenStack sounds great. It's going gonna, it's gonna to meet our needs. How do we figure out how to get there? Uh, so the foundation has put together a number of eBooks. Uh, there's two available uh, if you go to openstack.org slash enterprise. Uh, the first one's talking about the business cases of, uh, of OpenStack. And then the path to cloud one is helping you figure out how do you get how do you get going with OpenStack? What kind of team do you need? You know, helping you figure out which of those decisions you need to make to uh, pick the model that works for you. Uh, the ebook is there. We actually have some hard copies available after the session. Uh, so if you want to come up, we have uh, some of them available here. Um, but if you, if you don't get to grab one, like I said, they're on the website. And they also there's a link to Amazon to, uh, to get them from Amazon. This all sounds great. Well, how, I, how do we get more involved? It's not just you know, twice a year coming to a summit or, or once a year. Um, it, there's so many different ways you can get involved in OpenStack. Shamal already mentioned one of them, working groups. Uh, obviously, the key thing is if you're, if you're not already, which I think you have to be to buy a ticket to uh, the summit, but join the foundation. Mm -hmm. allows you to vote, um, vote for not just not just release names, but you know members on the on the uh, on the different committees and things like that. There's tons of mailing lists for all those different working groups or individual projects that you're interested in. Um, and you can see on the, on the OpenStack site, there's a list of all of them. All the meetings, or, or most of the meetings for the projects and, and working groups and things like that are held on IRC. Uh, so the, the nice thing about that is transcripts are kept. So even if you miss a meeting or it's not, you know, it doesn't work with your, your, your time zone, it happens to be 2 a.m., you can go back and see what happened in that meeting uh, as well. If you're interested in contributing code to OpenStack, uh, there's a really good guide on the, on the OpenStack.org site to how, to how to get your environment set up to, to do some coding. Uh, and it's not just code, right? So one of, one of the most overlooked things I see is documentation. So even if you, you don't know uh, any bit of Python, documentation could always use, could always use some help, and, and it's pretty, pretty easy to contribute. And, and the next summit that you attend, if you come a few days early, there's also Upstream University which happens generally a day or two before the summit actually begins. And in there, you'll get you know, core contributors and people that have been participating in the OpenStack commu uh, technical community for a while actually walking you through how do you do a commit to OpenStack, uh, what are best practices for commit messages, how do you interface and you know, uh, get buy-in for your blueprints or your uh, code changes, et cetera. So it's, it's very worthwhile if you plan on uh, developing within the OpenStack community to attend upstream you as a good starting point. Yeah, and you can, you can always get started with something as simple as re code reviews. Uh, so you can see other people's code, look through it, you know, give comments, give a, give a plus one or minus mm -hmm. one on it, and just even to, to get introduced to the community. So it's, there's, there's a lot of ways to be involved, and it doesn't have to be just coding. Uh, there, there's a lot of different ways you can influence the community and the direction of the projects and, and give back to the community without just writing lines of code. Okay. So we're going to talk about Newton specifically. What's, what's new with Newton and what some of the models are? Um. Yep. So Newton is the 14th release of the OpenStack platform. 
And really, in Newton, the community came together and really innovated across the board, whether it was enhancement Synova, which is uh, virtual compute, uh, Ironic, which is bare metal, Magnum, or Courier, which are container-related, and really to define OpenStack as the one platform to manage all three, whether it's virtual machines, bare metal, containers. And also, as I mentioned earlier, there's a wide variety of uh, industries and markets that are participating in OpenStack as well. And really, as those needs from users surface, uh, you know, OpenStack uh, tries to accommodate those. So we're running more workloads across more industries, and that continues to be a trend uh, release after release. And then finally, um, through Newton, we've also made it a lot easier to manage these elements. So there's key enhancements to uh, Horizon, which is the user interface, as well as enhancements to APIs, such as micro-versioning in, in certain projects that allows APIs to be more flexible so they can be incrementally updated with new features, as well as allows potentially APIs to maintain some level of backwards compatibility as they move forward as well. Yeah, and a key thing there is even something as simple as the command line uh, interface. Previously, each project had their own uh, command line commands, and they didn't all exactly follow the same semantics and things like that, so that can be challenging the user. So the OpenStack Python client, uh, it's now on the 3.something release, uh, is bringing all those together under a single, a single command set, which has made things significantly easier for users as well. Yeah. And so... Obviously, as, as we talked about, you know, there were probably over 2,000 plus contributors to this release, a lot of moving parts, but it, we looked at you know, what are the key release themes for Newton, and it comes down to scalability, resiliency, and user experience. And user experience is not uh, you know, just the operator experience, so there's, two, there's multiple types of users. So user is a very loaded word yeah. within the community. Uh, user can pertain to people operating clouds, it can pertain to people developing applications to run on the cloud, and it could even be considered the end user who might be doing self-service through uh, OpenStack provided applications as well. Um, so across the board, those have been key focuses. And we've been ramping up on you know, how to scale up, scale down, for example, in Nova. Uh, we've been also focused on this concept called Cells v2 in, in Nova, which allows uh, better segmentation of the various layers of the Nova service to make it more scalable. Uh, heat has also moved to a horizontal engine. So Heat, uh, in the past, had a single engine, and now they can actually use a distributed engine model going forward. And uh, for bare metal, there have been actually strides in Newton as well. Uh, the key two things for bare metal, namely, have been uh, the introduction of multi-tenant networking, as well as the ability to have multiple compute services managing bare metal, so to, in, to introduce the notion of high availability for uh, bare metal as well. And then from a resiliency perspective, uh, the Keystone team um, did phenomenal work in introducing rolling upgrades as a concept uh, within the project. And uh, Neutron had made, has made strides around uh, database migrations as well. And then from a user experience perspective, uh, Nova has allowed the, the, uh, the uh, capability to uh, change some of the parameters without having to reload the service, as well as they've, they've taken uh, the policy files in OpenStack to find uh, access to certain services and, and uh, capabilities of the service itself. And Nova has actually made the policy embedded in code now. So as a user or operator, you no longer have to uh, make sure that you know, the file is set up properly. The only time you modify the file now is if you're overwriting a default. So it's, it's, you know, some of these things might seem little, but at scale, they provide a lot of value overall. And then with, uh, with Newton, you know, the OpenStack was awarded the Core Infrastructure Initiative badge. Uh, because of the great work by the OpenStack security team in terms of uh, making you know, strides in process around vulnerability management, as well as uh, you know, the contributors stepping up and the velocity of security uh, focus and changes has also increased greatly in the community. The other big thing is, as we've been talking about interoperability, um, you, you probably have heard DEF Core referenced a few times uh, today. And the DEF Core working group has now been renamed the Introp working group. And really, it's to reflect its uh, strategic mission because Introp really captures the essence of what that team is trying to do. And uh, the Introp team is actually working currently on new guidelines. As we talk about interoperability, 
they're working on, you know, how do we expand interoperability to include additional capabilities that have been introduced in Newton, in Mikata, for example, because they, they kind of go two releases, three releases back. And at the same time, a lot of the work that was done in the interoperability challenge will also be fed back into that team so they can kind of uh, do an analysis of, based on these discoveries, are there action items that we can take and you know, help resolve to make interoperability better for everyone? Yeah, this is, this is uh, you know, some of the other big trends we've seen with Newton. Uh, the number of public cloud providers, uh, you know, for a while had the growth had sl uh, slowed down there a bit, but now it's picked back up on the public cloud side. And, and a, a really interesting one has been the, the amount of growth in China around OpenStack. It's you know, not just in the, you know, the first place I think we saw a lot was the telco market, but now it's expanded out from there. Absolutely. Uh, all, across all industries, uh, the, China mar uh, the market in China is growing phenomenally for OpenStack clouds, as well as uh, they just had their first OpenStack Day event as well, which was a huge success. And so I can only anticipate that's going to be growing based on the adoption mm -hmm. going forward. Uh, from an IBM perspective, as you know, Todd mentioned, he was involved in the project before it was a foundation, before the OpenStack Foundation was created. Uh, IBM has been committed to OpenStack. Um, for you know, a long time as well. And so on this slide, you can actually see our, our pace of uh, you know, ramping up in, uh, contributors as well as our dedication to OpenStack uh, through the releases. And notably, if you look at Newton, in Newton, uh, we had 42 core contributors. And we had you know, the key areas of security, as I mentioned. Security has been a big area that we've been working on, as well as networking enhancements. And then definitely, interoperability is, is, is a top priority as well. So from a, and from a networking perspective, uh, the team has been working on you know, helping um, scale the OpenStack OVN support, as well as uh, helping with the Get Me a Network feature. And Get Me a Network, uh, to, to describe what that is, is effectively as someone who is provisioning an instance, in the past, you would have to make sure that your uh, you know, provider network or your, your networking is actually set up uh, before launching the instance. And in this case, you can actually, the, the operator can specify a auto allocation topology. And you as a user, when you boot up an instance, if there's no network available and auto allocate is, is turned on, it will actually provision all the underlying things that are needed to get you connected on the network. Uh, security wise, uh, we've been working, as I mentioned, on you know, solidifying the process around vulnerability management, as well as uh, making sure that you know, vulnerability management as a tag is applied to projects to show you know, maturity of a project and service mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I think, I think a key piece there to note is a lot of the work IBM's worked on Keystone uh, to provide capabilities for rolling upgrades. And you know, it seems un, you know, initially disconnected, but rolling upgrades for any of the projects are a key piece from a security perspective. Um, because if you have to take an outage to do an upgrade, you're not going to do them as often, and then you're not going to apply patches as often, and, and that's a security challenge. So the more often we can apply these patches and, and patch these services, the, the more secure we can keep them. Yeah. And the good news there is, um, you know, through the work that was done by Cinder, through Keystone now, through Nova, uh, there's a standard set of things that projects know now to do to enable rolling upgrade support. So in the future, we would expect more and more projects to be able to uh, support a similar model, hopefully. Uh, we also worked tremendously in uh, the OpenStack Heat project to uh, you know, enhance the capabilities of uh, taking Tosca templates and translating them into Heat as well. Um, so we've introduced uh, support for authentication, We've introduced support for auto scaling as well uh, mm -hmm. when you do the translation. And uh, for Trove, we uh, enhanced the DB2 guest image and the driver to allow for uh, various benefits as well, such as online backups and also uh, being able to manage the configurations of the database through the Trove service itself. Finally, uh, just to give a good snapshot of, you know, where was IBM through Newton? Um, we had two of the top 10 contributors. Overall, we had 42 different cores, and we were number five in terms of both reviewing and committing code into OpenStack Newton release. And here's a snapshot of all the different contributions that uh, we made through this release. So phenomenal work uh, and velocity by the community, and IBM is definitely trying to play our part mm -hmm. in this uh, evolution of OpenStack. 
If you're interested in more about the Newton release, not just you know what IBM's done with it, but what's what's new in it, uh, Brad Topol has a has a blog post uh, on it, going into the details of what's in the release, and then also, as always, the the foundation has a has a landing place you know, on the website for the latest version, you know, the release notes, if you will, and uh, here's the highlights, here's what's new, uh, and, and all of that type of information. I mentioned the the work on the uh, identity management. Stuff. We have a great O'Reilly book that uh, a couple people from IBM were involved with, and we have copies of this available at the IBM booth. So if you're interested in, in a free copy of you know, this, it's a, it's a great deep dive book on Keystone. Uh, it's available at the, at the IBM booth. Yeah. So that's, that's it for us for now. Um, in just a little bit, we're going to take a, a short break. And we're going to come back in about uh, 15, 10, 15 minutes with uh, Jesse Proudman to talk about the IBM Open Cloud. So thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.